Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back to Interstage Window, my Saturday stream, which is a stream with my friends. And today I have here with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. Oh my gosh, you guys. Hey, Kitty with the first. Uh, it's oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Kitty, oh my you, God. You have, to be, you have to be one of the first tomorrow too, because as you guys know, we are going to have a, a birthday party, but for the kitty cats. But for today, what are we talking about for today, Landon? We're going to talk about... Karen trying to make me a weave. That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Death Note. It is that time of year where it's, I am forced to watch an anime. It is another episode of the Weebification of Landon. So everybody, get your favorite sweet. Get your chips. Okay. Get your black eyeliner. It is time to talk about Death Note. So I'm going to go. We're going to we're going to jump into it. I'm going to show you guys the opening slide because I just I think it's so it's so funny wait where'd my mouse go when you have three monitors sometimes it's hard to find your mouse there it goes okay here we go <laughs> the person who controls the death note slideshow determines the speed at which the slides are changed <laughs> thank you so much kitty thank you and Landon's nails are on theme heck yeah we're all on theme today we're I also I was like doing my eye makeup and I was like, blue, because it looks like blue circles under Elle's eyes and blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, no, we're going to go red like apples. We're going to mm -hmm. channel it. We're going to channel that Ryuk. <laughs> That's <Shishinigami>. right. <laughs> That's right. So as always here on Interstage Window, this is not a spoiler free podcast. If you have never seen any of the versions of Death Note, we're going to spoil basically everything about it, especially the good stuff. Now, Death Note is one of those shows that I think even if it's totally spoiled for you, it's still going to be in a lot of ways good. And we'll talk about that later on. But all we're going to focus on today is part one. OK, so we're just going to go with part one of the anime. So we both watched the anime version, the original like first adaptation. I have read the manga before and seen several other adaptations, but Landon has only before this ever seen the Netflix movie, right, Landon? Listen, I understand that the Netflix <laughs> movie is bad. I watched it for the cringe. I watched it because I was like, man, there is a monster and a book and it's going to be bad. And that's why I, I it was bad. Yeah, And I and acknowledged <laughs> it was bad before going in. So I'm sorry to disappoint that this is the only thing I've consumed of this particular point of media. But now that you've seen the anime, anime adaptation, which is widely considered one of the better of the adaptations of it, you can see how robbed Willem Dafoe was by being in the oh. American Netflix version. Because imagine like a oh good God. American version of, of Death Note with Willem Dafoe as Ryuk. Imagine. I it. was just like, Ryuk is Willem Dafoe? Per yeah. Mm -hmm genius amazing Perfect casting mm -hmm. if he was the voice actor of ryuk in the animated show mm -hmm. i do however have something spicy to say oh oh do tell part one mm -hmm. movie mm. <laughs> part two <laughs> <laughs> okay, I cannot disagree. So if you guys are, if that intrigues you, please come back next week when we talk about part two of Death Note. <laughs> I'm still going. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, Ooh. sorry. Ooh, I said okay. it was spicy. It's time to take our chips and eat it, you guys. It's time. Okay. <laughs> I, don't have I just have Sour Patch children. That's okay. That's okay. We can both be our own unique mixtures of um of light and L today. Yes. Landon, I don't know if you if you know this, but everyone that got the go live notification, what it said for them is L slash light, who tops, which is truly the most important question of Death Note. <laughs> We're uh, I L is a twelve year old boy in my brain. Oh my god, you're so wrong, but whatever. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> it's how he sits. There's something just so unappealing okay, like, about it. <laughs> but like, tell me, tell me, does this not make you feel like, does this not make you feel like infinitely autistically smarter? Oh my god, I can't do it. I'm, my, my thunder thighs are too big. Hang on. I can, do, I can do this. Okay. No, it makes we you. It. It, it makes you look like you are a pigeon perched on the edge of a building. Maybe I am afraid. Maybe afraid I am. of oh. your own flight. That's what Maybe it makes I am. me feel. 
Maybe, maybe I am. Maybe I'm, I'm scared of my own intelligence and my own ability. Listen, I am a Sherlock and Moriarty shipper until the day I die. I do not get it. <laughs> it's because you weren't a kid when you were watching it anyway. That's true. We, and I'm, you'll hear us, you'll hear us continue to talk about this yeah. because uh, of course, Karen decided as we were planning this stream to be like, Landon, it's dreary. <laughs> and then I had to stand on a soapbox, a literal soapbox, about how it was not, in fact, dreary and how that comparison makes no sense. If you were there. If you were there at the time. <laughs> there was anyway. a soapbox. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Rule 21, the person who controls the Death Note slideshow determines the speed at which the slides are changed and I control it. So there you go. Okay. <laughs> let's right. talk about our favorite things <laughs> our first i mean we did spoilers do we want to do trigger warnings we're gonna talk oh, yeah, about death yeah. well death the death happens in death note you guys did you did you know that i mean if you couldn't tell by the title people die we're gonna people we're gonna die when about, they're killed <laughs> then we're gonna talk about the sociopathic uh sociopathic behaviors of a 20 some year old boy <laughs> which i feel like is most medias these days mm -hmm. uh <laughs> you know for the gonna... conceit of death note it's really not that spicy it no. could be spicier. Yeah, it could be. Mm. Suicide's talked about a little bit. We're not going to mm. dive into it, but it exists in this universe. Yeah. Uh, I think that's all. I think that's all the spice. Yeah, that's about it. <clears throat> okay. So if none of that appeals to you, do you watch, watch our Harry Potter content? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I think I think that our Harry Potter content is probably spicier. But, you know, yeah, it depends on which true. episode you watch. There's 24 I'm, hours of it, you guys. I'm going to also let the viewers at home know the, the 20 minutes prior to us getting on stream was just one mistake after another happened. And so I'm in a little silly, goofy mood because of it. <laughs> uh, and it's fun. Layers. <laughs> it's so, and it was just like back and forth. It was really fun. <laughs> yeah, super fun. All right. Favorite things. Karen, in this traditional, classic, one could even say, anime Mm. Uh, what would your favorite thing be? Okay. My favorite thing in Death Note Part 1 is Naomi Misura. Okay. This girl is the OG. This girl is the goat. She's in like 1.5 episodes, but in my heart, she's in all 26. Okay. She is the best. So Death Note has a lady problem. All right. Death Note has such a big lady problem that we're actually going to talk about it in Part 2 next week. But I would like just to have a big shout out to Naomi Misura, who is only killed by the Death Note because the authors were like, shit, we wrote somebody actually smart. We got to fucking get rid of this. Give, get rid of her. She's too smart. She's she's like a real, actual, intelligent adult person. Oh, no. What too have smart. we done? <laughs> too smart does not sit on chairs. Weird must kill her. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, she's actually like. A real, um, you know, in, in investigator. She's actually a really a good detective, and we can't have that in Death Note. So we got to get fucking rid of her. She has the most tragic death scene, you guys. She the most tragic. Okay, when I watched this originally, I was on the edge of my fucking seat because as soon as this woman comes on, and uh, and I realize. So by the way, Naomi Misura, who she is, is she is the fiance of Ray Penber excellent english name that someone definitely has in this world um that uh, she's she's the fiance of him they move back to japan because she is originally from japan and she wants to get married and they're having some kind of contention about whether they should have a more traditional japanese lifestyle um which is you know where she is from and what he desires even though he's american or so a more american lifestyle which he is american but she desires okay so there's something very interesting going on there so i'm like oh it's a, yes, it's yes, an yes. actually well really like interesting concept for yes. such a side character yes it was yes. like wow you're actually she's so cool thought into this yeah she's so cool so so ray penber is um a, an fbi agent that is uh assigned to tail light as a potential suspect in the Death Note killings, right? They think that he's possibly a suspect and they're investigating him. Ray Pember is the particular FBI agent that is investigating him. Ray Pember comes home, tells Naomi Misura about all the things going on with the case because she recently retired from the same job as an, uh, a detective, right? I, they don't, I don't think they specify who she was working for. Maybe it was the FBI. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. Um, and we know that she's really super good at it because she used to do work cases with 
L, who is considered the best detective in the entire world at this time. So he comes home, he's telling her about it. And she's like, hmm, well, I think this, this, and this. And she's like, totally right. And then um, Ray Penber, unfortunately, is meets his demise at the hands of Kira. And she says, I'm going to solve it. I'm going to avenge him. And I was like, you fucking go, girl. Yeah, you do it. And then... Um, girl she does, Yeah, and then she doesn't. Light figures out that she knows. No, and he kills but she's, her. she's so smart about it. Oh, yes. my God. Let me tell you. There's she's spoiler. So Spoiler. I loved the first 12 episodes. Mm. And this this was peak for me. Yeah. We're just watching Light slowly try to figure out how to manipulate this girl who will not be manipulated. Mm-hmm. This is what I want the entire show to be. This is what I wanted it to be. This well, is, this is this what is the first 14 episodes basically are. It's awesome. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's great. It's it's so good. And you're just like dodging in and out. And it's like, yeah, fuck yeah. How are you gonna how's he gonna solve this one? How are you gonna how do you gonna solve this one? And then the moment he does, the moment he writes her name down, the moment that he wins, and she just falls lifeless, mm-hmm. you know that she's just about to go like die. Yeah. So good. Truly so good. masterpiece. Masterful. Yeah. So fun. So good. She gets one of the best backstories in the show. She gets one of yes. the some of the she's featured in some of the best episodes of the show. Yes. And she gets one of the best deaths of the show. Truly. All of it. Perfect. All of it. So good. So good. So good. So good. So uh, that's my favorite yeah. thing. <laughs> Naomi Misura. Um, so Landon, what is your favorite thing in Death Note Part One? Well, give me a spirit of death and I'll give you all my love for it. My favorite, apathetic, done with this world, sassy little demon child, Ryuk, mm. uh, and his obsession slash addiction and overdramatic scission of apples. Mm-hmm. Uh, just was like, this creature is endearing. And he's smart and he's funny and he just likes chaos. And this, this is the one that I will cling to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> this is the, this is the real hero of the show. Mm-hmm. Uh, even though there's very little, at least in the first part, uh, there's very little change on who Ryuk is as a character. He's kind of just like that one character who is immortal and forever mm-hmm. just how they are. Uh but it's just like, I'm like, man, you have the funniest comebacks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're just you're just front row seat- seating to the destruction of this world. And that's awesome. <laughs> so you know what Ryuk is? Ryuk is the audience surrogate character, which, of course, yeah. is why he doesn't change. I'm trying to think of a better audience surrogate character in anything. And I can't really think of one. He is one of the best audience surrogate characters that exists, yeah. period. He also... Anything. He also gives real Iago energy, both yes, the Shakespearean yes, yes. Iago and also the Aladdin Iago. Mm. He's just like truly like, well, <laughs> that's what you want to do. <laughs> I'm just going to remind you that I know when you die. I'm not going to tell you anything about it, but I know it. Mm. <laughs> So good. I, so good. I I agree. Like when you think about all the characters of Death Note, um, you think about Light and L. Right. But with it not considering light or L specifically, I agree. Like these two, these two right here, Naomi yeah. and Ryuk, you know who I absolutely want to best about, side characters. You know who I want to team up these two? I want these oh my two God. to have a spit off. <gasps> Naomi she, and Misa are getting the death she note. She would change the world for good. She would do it. All of the themes that, that about death, corrupting, evil versus good, none of that's necessary. Because Naomi would change the world with Ryuk by her side. Oh my god. I would so watch that. I would so watch the corruption yeah. story of somebody like Naomi Misura with a death note. So good. It would be so good. Yeah. Yes, mm-hmm. yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. For those of you who are have made it this far and are just like, what the heck is this show? <laughs> it's an anime show, which means that you are going to get the lovely, lovely summarization of it. And there's a lot of it. <laughs> uh, from Karen, so can you please summarize the first uh, 12, 14 episodes, or 25, sorry, 25 episodes mm-hmm. of the show? Okay. Major spoilers ahead. Here we go. We're going to summarize Death Note 
part one to the best of my ability. All right. So it starts with Ryuk, a god of death, is bored, and he decides to cure his boredom. He's going to give his death note to a random human. The death note is a notebook. To survive, Shinigami write the names of humans into their death notes to steal the remainder of their natural lives. So this is how they this is how they live, right? Light Yagami, a top high school student in Japan, finds Ryuk's death note and discovers that by following the rules explained inside, he can use it to cause people to drop dead simply by writing their names while imagining their faces, just like a god of death. Unfortunately, Light does not get his life extended light by this like a god of death would, but still, he cannot, he has all the other powers. Ryuk then proceeds to follow Light around and watch him to cure his boredom. This proves to be very successful when Light decides to use the notebook to punish criminals. He believes that he can create a more just, good, and safe world by killing anyone who commits violent acts, not only by them dying, but by other criminals fearing their own sudden deaths. Light quickly gains a following as well as an anti-following where he is called Kira. Many love him, many hate him, and some even regard him as a god. Light is challenged by the world-renowned detective L, who proves a formidable opponent when he manages to very quickly pinpoint Light's location to Kanto, Japan. He does this by addressing Kira directly and lying on TV. He says that the broadcast is worldwide and reveals his face and his name. Light is unable to hold back and kills L on live TV. There are two small problems, though. The man who was broadcast is not L, but instead a death row inmate. And his broadcast was not worldwide, but in the Kanto region of Japan, okay? What proceeds is a cat and mouse game between L and Light that includes a new twist every episode or two, and these twists are including, but not limited to, us, the audience, finding out that the head of the Kira investigation is actually Light's father, Light outsmarting both an FBI agent and the agent's fiancé, who both almost catch him being Kira, L deducing that Kira must have a connection to one of the investigators and thus making Light a suspect, Light managing to use the death note while his entire room is full of wiretaps and cameras. That was so Light- cool. So it was so Such- cool, right? Sorry, <laughs> I, I don't I know I'm not supposed to interrupt, but that episode was the right? best episode. So good. So good. So good. Um L revealing himself to Light as hell when he begins to suspect that Light is Kira. One of Kira's fans, Misa, finding a Death Note herself, falling in love with Light, and allowing her own abilities to be used by Light. We all find out Shinigami can be killed if they kill a human to save another human's life. Light and Misa both ending up arrested for suspicion of being the two Kiras. Light and Misa both giving up their Death Notes so that they lose their memories of being Kira so that they can be freed. Light, including a fake rule in the death note that once you start writing names, if you don't do so every 13 days, you'll die. Light's father pretending he's going to shoot both Light and Misa to prove they're not Kira. Light manages to help L find the man who currently has the death note after he gives it up, which happens to be a top level executive at a large company. We're going to talk about that later. And those are just some of the twists and turns that the story takes you on. Anyway, Part one all comes to an end when Light and L catch Higuchi of Yotsuba Group and Light touches the Death Note once again. All of his memories flood back and he is now again Kira. He kills Higuchi so that he um, is the notebook owner again. Misa also gets her memories restored and begins acting as Akira once again. L is able to deduce that Misa was and now is again the second Kira. And Elle begins to enact a plan that will prove that she's guilty. But before she can, Rem, her Shinigami, chooses to kill Elle, thus saving Misa's life and destroying her own. So at the end of part one of Death Note, Light has won. He and Misa are gods of death among the human world and begin in earnest enforcing their worldview in hopes that a bright future awaits humanity. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, well, I am impressed <laughs> on wrapping the entirety of the season up in just that short amount of time. Good job, dude. 
Thank you. And there is so much more. Like I only yes. put in the twists that were like important to the story beats, but almost every episode has something engaging and surprising happening in it. Yeah, I mean that's the thing that we we we've talked about and off camera, but like it's like every single 30 minute episode and it's really with ads and everything like that more like a 25 minute episode needs to have its own story beat and story climax and and sort of like story arc and so every single episode has something that happens uh it just so happens that the first 14 episodes are the best (laughs) we're gonna talk about that we're gonna talk about that we will uh but now that we know what death note is with that amazing summary Perhaps we can discuss where it came from and who (laughs) wrote it and how it became a part of existence. So let's talk about the history of a Death Note. Yes. So anybody that was going to the bookstore in the early 2000s, I'm sure these these spines look super familiar, right? With all the different Shinigamis. Um, designs on the on the spines like that which is awesome because we only see like one or two of them in the show or yeah sorry, not one or two I think we see three of these in the show yes three three actually have character names and the rest are like maybe have a line here or there but really not really <laughs> not really <laughs> yeah so Death Note is by writer um, Tsugumi Oba and artist Takeshi Obata so Oba is a pen name There's no official reveal of who this author is. If you look at other Death Note analyses on the YouTubes, you will find pretty goddamn good guesses at who this guy is, but it's not been ever officially confirmed and there's deep dives into that. So I didn't feel like it was important for us to talk about here. All we know for sure is that this is a pen name by some other mangaka. And this is obviously a mangaka that is already famous, right? Because if you look at just what Tsugumi Obata has, o- o- Oba has worked on, um, sorry, their last names, their, their names are too similar. Tsugumi Oba, <laughs> what he has worked on, obviously he is not an amateur. He's never released an amateur anything, okay? So he's kind of like L a little bit. He's using a, 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 a pseudonym, right? And you can't find any amateur work by him. It doesn't seem to exist, Okay. So Death Note all began as a manga in Shonen Jump, and the intention of Death Note always was to be a Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty story, but with Moriarty as the POV character. So if you like Sherlock in any iteration, there's stuff for you in Death Note. It it is very much a Sherlockian story. Mm -hmm. Uh, It just so happens that we are on the side of the villain. Mm-hmm. Uh, of Moriarty yeah. and yeah it's 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 a very it's a very interesting retelling in its own way mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now this is really just part one a lot of what I am saying about this Sherlock Moriarty part of it that all changes in part two but we're gonna talk about part two next week okay so I want to explain yes. a little bit about what the original manga was commenting on because the original manga is a different kind of um, focal point than a, basically all the adaptations. <laughs> so to explain, what the original manga was commenting on is the fear and anxiety that was felt by the lost generation. Okay, So in Japan, they had an economic boom in the 80s that busted at the very end of the 80s, right? So everyone that graduated high school, college, that, you know, that time that was entering the workforce in the 90s and the early 2000s, um, they kind of were entering this, this place where there was no growth, there was no opportunities, finding a job was very hard, the jobs that existed were really crappy. So they were a lost generation. And because of this, there was a lot of um, crime on the rise in Japan, you know, people students that normally would have entered the workforce instead got involved in gangs because, you know, um, Japan is and was at that time hyper capitalist. So you've got to make money or you're going to die. OK, that's just how that is. So they would join I, gangs. Yeah. They would join cults, you know. So there was some. Yeah. The, th- the thing about culture of Japan, especially in that day and age is that you had to be a part of something whether that be a corporation whether that be dedication to your family whether that be a cult or a gang there Mm -hmm. was a sense of missing identity if you were Mm -hmm. not a part of something Mm -hmm. uh, a a machine larger than you um that is how the world and industry worked that's uh, in some ways how it continues to work 
Uh, and so when all of a sudden you had a lot of people who were qualified and had gone to school and had done everything that they were supposed to have done to enter into industries that weren't prepared for them, mm -hmm. uh, there was a lot of collapse. And also because of how socialization and the social structure and and generally how people connect in the culture in Japan, there was no, it wasn't like the bust or the millennial move home sort of movement. Uh, there was no sort of thing like that. You you moved forward anyway. And so there was mm -hmm. a lot of all of a sudden gang violence and rise in gangs and cults uh, and those industries kind of creating their own pathways. Yep, yep. So this is kind of what um, Oba and Obata were trying to comment on they were like gosh how you know let's let's like explore something that goes into the fear and anxiety that uh, we've been we're facing during this decade right this 90s and early 2000s time and so this is why death notes um in addition to the the sherlock light versus l thing this is why also a, a comparison in death note that is really important um is light compared to matsuda okay so light and matsuda are of similar ages, but light feels like you know, then we need to take drastic action to correct the world while um, Matsuda is a little bit more, you know, he's lost, but he's a little bit optimistic that if I just keep going, things will get better. Um, and that's why throughout the story, Matsuda is really the only character that is sympathetic to Kira without being like an actual Kira follower. He's supposed to represent how what the authors think like most young people probably feel like is Matsuda, right? So that's why those characters are the way they are. And you can kind of see when you think about the story in the terms of thinking about the way L, Light, and Matsuda all act, they really are, those three really are the backbone when you read the manga. And that's not totally true in the anime, which we're going to talk not. about. We're going to talk about later on. Um, but uh, so we're going to just put a little pin in that. But that's why the manga is a little bit different and is really about those three characters. Yeah. And I obviously not having the back as much background on the particular authors, but I think that there's also an idea to Matsuro's character of not only is this how he, how most young people probably feel, but also a level of this is how most young people should probably feel. Like yeah. that level of of like, okay, well, you can either be obsessive good or obsessive terrible fascist evil, mm -hmm. or you could just keep doing everything at the standard in which we were doing it before and mm -hmm. hope it gets better. Yeah, uh, and the authors because, ad admit that they relate yeah. most to Matsuda. They relate yes. most to him and his character. And, uh, and they say this like a little bit ashamedly, like they wish they maybe had more guts, like Light does, not manifesting in the same way, but they don't. And in reality, they feel like Matsuda. But also like in comparison to, and we'll talk about like Light's moral morality, but it, there is a lesson there of like, if you push the system too much and try to change the system too much, it will corrupt and it will corrupt you and the whole system will break. Of like trying to sit there and be like, oh, okay, uh, the rise and the commentary on criminals. And then I think it was also like media wanting to like not acknowledge where the cults and the issues came from. Mm -hmm. And so instead, the imagination is, is that a 16, a 16 to 18 year old boy just starts killing them off. And that is the correct thing to do mm -hmm. <laughs> as the media in that time would have liked for it to happen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a there's a whole lot of there's a whole lot there <laughs> yeah so if you've if you've watched the like most people probably if you've seen death note if you've seen the anime i highly recommend if you have going back and reading the original manga because i think you'll you'll find a whole nother very interesting angle that the that is not obvious in the anime it might not have even been purpose like i'm sure i i know that there was a purpose for making these three characters represent mm. in the backbone but like as we'll talk about a lot in part two and, and mentioned a little bit here like politics is not in the forefront a political statement is not in the forefront of the creation of oh this. no it's not it's uh not. but they're making a political st statement by commentating on the political 
ness of what's happening in Japan during the yes. time of the publication. Yes. So it is political subconsciously or yeah, unaware think, or, or yeah. naively political. Death Note is a great example of when people say like all art is politic. It doesn't matter. You you don't have to intend to do it. You, you're just going to do it because we all live in a society. You as a writer are going to write what you know and what you know yeah. is your beliefs of the political system you are stuck in. <laughs> yes. Uh, don't know where that accent came from, but that's what we chose. And it's true. Doesn't it make it any less like true. It's, it's not like maybe, maybe a bad Zizek impression. Like, right, uh, we're just, doing a little Slavoj Zizek. <laughs> I was like, actually, I'm just going to, I'm just going to like really take the owl from the blow pop commercial. <gasps> oh my god, that's what I was the really owl channeling does right sound there. A little bit like Zizek, though. <laughs> it does. It's the same voice. Mm. <laughs> this is what we're going to do. <laughs> a one. Oh gosh. A two. <laughs> All right. Uh. Uh, but yeah, no, I think that, that all all of that is important because we like to put media in their context, especially looking mm. at it from 20 years down the line mm -hmm. of the first like publication of this manga. How has it changed? How does it stand up? And how does it inform both the publishing of the stories, but also the popularization of it? Because yeah. these these mangas were popular. Mm -hmm. uh, and then came the TV show, which was popular. And then yeah. came it, and then it crossed international seas to 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 America, where it also resonated mm -hmm. with a whole line of people who are going through something similar. I don't know exactly the dates in which it it uh, crossed into American airways, but I think you said it when you were in high school or you were in college, right? Mm -hmm. I was in so college that when been, I was watching Death Note. I mean, that would have been after the 2008 market crash. It was right around before. that time. I'm pretty right sure before. I first saw it right before. So its popularity hit a whole generation of people who are about to go through the same exact thing mm. that the people who are consuming it and found and resonated with it in Japan were going through. Mm-hmm. Mm mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, and it continues to be relevant. Like, there's a yes. reason that even though everyone made hella fun of the Netflix adaptation of Death Note, everyone still watched it. And there's parts of it that are good. Just mostly it is not good. <laughs> mostly it is not good. Yeah. All right. Let's get into it, though. Because okay. I think, like, what this all feeds into is the world that is created mm -hmm. within this story. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the world building, the lore, the ideas, the things that came from this, because we have a really cool, I don't think, have we done, I don't think we've done urban fantasy. We haven't mm. media, we haven't talked about urban fantasy yet. We have not. This is our first urban fantasy this series, first, is it not? Yeah, yeah. I believe it is. So urban fantasy yeah. uh, exists within our realm, but takes uh, the truths of our world and our universe and either twists them or reveals them to be underlying underlying fantasy mm -hmm. so it takes place both in the modern day but also that there is something beneath the surface that is unknown usually to the characters within the story but certainly mm -hmm. within unknown to the reader of the story yeah uh and what that produces in this particular in this particular way is the concept of the death note and shiragami which are yeah. spirits and of other planes and other worlds uh that are spirits of death mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um they feed off of their in eternal immortal uh basically feed off of death mm -hmm. in some ways more than they do represent death itself and how karen kind of said it in the um in the summary was that they do this by shortening a mortal's life by like writing their name in their death note that mortal then dies and the Shirogami is able to consume the years in which that mortal would have lived had mm -hmm. the Shirogami not interfered mm -hmm. and that sustains them for a future life. Yep. So this is a take on the Shinigami from Japanese folklore, which is basically, it basically means death god or death spirit or death mm -hmm. ghost or something like that, right? 
So um, this is a very particular take on it where the author has imagined that there's this Shinigami realm, that all of the Shinigami live, and that the Shinigami are basically uh, sad, decrepit creatures who have lost their purpose for living. They don't even know why they're around anymore. They don't know why to survive. They must, you know, continue to kill humans. They don't necessarily have any interest in it. And the way that this is described in, in both the show and the manga is what that means is they all just kind of sit around and gamble. <laughs> so this is the author's well, perspective of like wasting your life is chilling and gambling. <laughs> it, I think it also like represents two several things. I want to first put a pin in the concept that this is already a thing. They yeah. have taken from Japanese folklore, the Shinigami uh, death spirits. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be important for a later conversation. Second of all, I think this also feeds into, uh, again, Japanese very hyper-capitalist society mm -hmm. of work, 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 work. I mean, if you do not know much about Japanese culture, uh, that that it is probably one of the most work-forward capitalist societies in the world in a very different way from America where we have it instilled in us that we must work to survive mm -hmm. uh, J Japan Japanese citizens have a lot of pride in their work to the point that they work themselves literally to death Yes, that does uh, happen there. It's a little it bit different. In, in America, like a lot of our overworking comes from these these like Calvinist ideals that like, you know, if if you work hard, then you're going to succeed. Um, you know, use your blessings that up. God gave you. you yeah, know, you'll go up in the system. Yes, like there yes. is an upward formation that Americans in try to strive for. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist in Japan. No, in Japan, it's uh, more like, you know, it is my duty to make sure that I take care of others and I must respect the hierarchy. So if my boss is staying in the office until 9 p.m., I can't be seen leaving before my boss leaves. That would be so gauche. Um, you know, I, I can't possibly be somebody that makes uh, less money because I have to support my family. You know, um, I, I have to make sure I have enough to saved for, for my retirement as well as helping out my parents when they're old. Like those are more the forces as opposed yes. to like the Puritan work ethic type of forces that we have here. But the results, the results are very similar. <laughs> they, they both exist in a, in a capitalist yeah. society. Yeah. Uh, so it is very interesting that the writers create a realm where the Shinigami are have no interest and even mock one another for working mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. that the concept of 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 life and that if you are not working hard then there is no point to work at all yeah um and it is that kind of like black and white thinking that presents itself in this in this concept which i always i thought was very interesting with how they portray the Shinigami world. Because yeah. the reality is, is that the world is rotting around them. And there are small hints throughout the series that it wasn't always like that. Yeah. That this realm used to be alive in a way that was different than what we see. Uh, and it is no longer like that. As if the Shinigami have, had done all of the work to suck the world dry. Mm -hmm. uh, and then now find no purpose in work. And it's very interesting that the three Shinigami in part one that actually get names and, and a little bit of backstory to them are all Shinigami that are looking at the human world and saying, gosh, it's so much more interesting and vibrant over mm -hmm. there, right? So you've got Ryuk, who has decided that gambling and just chilling is really boring and he's not going to do that anymore. So prior to him dropping his death note, he actually gets made fun of quite a lot for gazing towards the human world constantly, yeah. like as a hobby, like watching it like TV. Um, they think that that's really weird and he should stop doing that. <laughs> and we also know Ryuk has gone above and beyond the duties yeah. of his other his other shinigami yes because he has tricked the lord i can't remember what they call him the lord of the shinigami mm -hmm. to give him a second book mm -hmm. um so like, like why do has, you need two <laughs> yeah he's already gone above and beyond this concept of like of, of what he needs to do simply from boredom yeah not because there, there was any purpose behind it but he is a restless soul mm -hmm. looking for something more. Yeah, it's almost it almost feels like they're making fun of him for like Ryuk. Why'd you monetize your hobby? You could yeah. It's almost like that. <laughs> uh, it 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 feels that way, mm -hmm. uh, and it also feels like it, it feels very sloth 
like like there's a lot of i also think that there's a lot of like this is not the this is not the most forward christian representation but i think that the fact that there's a lot of like sloth like laziness Mm -hmm. that exists in this realm of decay uh and destruction and greed is fascinating yeah uh because i think that there is some undertone there yeah um then the the other shinigami that we meet is um is basically this is how rem who's also pictured on the slide ends up with two death notes as well so that she can give one to misa um, is her Shinigami friend basically also spends a lot of time watching the earth and he ends up becoming infatuated with Misa. Okay. Misa Misa is his favorite character on the earth TV show and he stands. Okay. And he's a stalker. <laughs> yeah. He's a, yeah. Like let us, let us be clear. He is a yeah. stalker. Yeah. Creepy. <laughs> and creepy. so Misa is an up and coming model. And so she has some, uh, uh, some fans at this time in on earth too. And she ends up with like an actual like human stalker and uh, it, t- it turns dangerous. And so the Shinigami says, Oh, she might not survive this. So I am going to write this guy's name in the death note and Shinigami have powers to see when people are intended to die. And so he can see that like, this is supposed to be her natural death. This is like the fate that she's supposed to die from this stalker. So he kills the stalker. And then Rem, who's his buddy, um, witnesses him turn to dust from this. So then she figures out, Oh, this is how Shinigami actually die by saving a human's life. So at this point, Rem has also been watching the Misa Misa show um, for years. So, which is apparently a very interesting show. I because guess <laughs> everyone who meets Misa Misa loves her. Yeah, and you know, Misa Misa is also Rem's favorite character, right? Yeah. So, um, in an effort to and, and arguably Elle's favorite character too. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> well, uh, the authors said Elle was lying then, but I don't know. I kind of believe him, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> Um, so Ram basically is like, okay, my buddy, um, would have wanted Misa to be happier, you know, would have wanted to, you know, reach out to her in some way. And so Ram goes down to earth and says, Hey, here's my buddy's death note. He died for you. You should have this. And so, you know, just like Ryuk, Ram ends up with two notebooks and gives one to a human. Um, and Ram's- And Ram is- is yeah, Re- I think that it, it lays the foundation of the relationship that Misa and Rem yeah. will later have, of Rem being in love and caring very deeply about Misa. Yeah, because Rem um, ends up falling in love with Misa too after they meet and like Rem gets to know her, actually interacting with her. But I think that there is something very different, whereas Ryuk, when given light the notebook, is very mocking of mm-hmm. it, of being like, oh, you found my thing. Never before has anybody written so many names. Mm-hmm. And also, like, I don't care about you. I'm going to remind you that you're going to die. Mm-hmm. I'm going to remind you of all these things, and I'm not going to help you. Not once, not at all. <laughs> I am and simply going to watch. And Ryuk- Rem is like, go ahead. Yeah, so so Ryuk is like the person that watches the, the TV show. Like, Ryuk's the normie that just watches the yeah. human TV show. And Rem is like the stan that won't stop yeah. tweeting about their favorite character on the human TV show. <laughs> yeah, Rem is adding every other Shinigami and is like, if anyone kills her, I will kill you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, and is like, actually, I like you so much. Here is a book that will allow you to kill people. Yeah. Uh, but like, that's an excuse, right? Mm-hmm. That's like, that. It's it, it gives very much the same energy of being like, oh, you're my ex-girlfriend and you left this, uh, you left a sock at my house, so I'm going to drive yeah. over to your apartment just to see you sort of yeah. thing. Oh my God, uh, it's, it's just like that. It's very much the same energy. Yeah. And then Rem sticks around. Like, obviously they 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 have the death notes in their hands, but, but sticks around and becomes a protector mm-hmm. of Misa. Uh, whereas Ryuk is an antagonistic sort of a voice of reason but also mocking in mm-hmm. lights in lights ear misa become or rem becomes a confidant and friend and love in some ways lover uh for uh, for misa mm-hmm. uh even mm-hmm. though misa is like not about that is very much focused on kira mm-hmm. uh it is that same, it's like that same obsession, right? Like, Misa yeah. has this obsession of Kira of like, oh my gosh, 
you've saved or you like avenged my parents death i love you so much i would do anything for you rem has that same energy for misa Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so like rem oh excuse me so like it's basically rem is in this situation where rem slowly starts to fall in love with misa instead of just being a stan upon meeting her and misa doesn't reject those affections she just simply Mm -hmm. doesn't reciprocate them yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but then you have like the relationship between Rem and Ryuk, which is a very fascinating because it is, <laughs> it's like two opposite people who enjoy the same hobby. Yeah. That's like taboo to enjoy in. Yeah. So it's just like being like, man, sunshine girl and dark boy sit at a bar, <laughs> uh, enjoying the hobby of whatever they're enjoying and don't talk to each other and are awkwardly like, do we have to? <laughs> do we have to interact <laughs> yeah they're really not interested in each other at, at all, all even though oh. on, in on some level they have a lot in common and they are both considered outcasts in and, the shinigami world and hypothetically have had centuries long relationships mm. with each other mm-hmm. because there are not many shinigami like we only mm-hmm. we as far as we're aware there's like 10 max yeah. I mean, it's so, implied that there's more than that, but there's not like a ton. It's not like the human world where there's billions of humans. It's not like yeah, that. and they've been alive for thousands and thousands of years, which means it it is there is like a pre relationship prior to this meeting mm-hmm. that Ren and Ryuk have that they just decide not to talk about. That they just decide to just be like, we're gonna pretend we don't know each other, but also like not be awkward about it. Yeah, <laughs> they're colleagues. They're colleagues. They're they are colleagues. Yeah, <laughs> it really gives that kind of energy. Yeah, um, which is fascinating because they hate because like Rem's hate for for light, which is the source of Ryuk's entertainment, mm-hmm. does develop an interesting. Yeah, can could be an interesting relationship of like dynamic. Yeah. So there are fanfics about this. I will tell you, there is like a tiny contingent of Rem and Ryuk um, art and uh, and fan works out there. Um, so that does exist. Not, that idea does exist in the fandom. I'm not sure I ship it. <laughs> I'm not sure I ship it either. But what I'm saying I, is like, I've seen it before. I've don't. come across this. I've come across Listen, this. Listen, I know everything exists on the, I know everything exists on the internet. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, they're okay. colleagues. They're colleagues. They're, at best. Yeah. <laughs> they just, they're colleagues they're, at best. Riku gives real asexual energy to me. Oh, I agree. He's I just totally like, agree. I'm here to watch the world burn and that's all I'm interested in. The most, the thing he, <laughs> the only thing he truly loves is apples. Yeah. Yeah. And that's not even love. Like, he hates that he loves apples. Yeah, he wishes he didn't, but he does. Yeah, he can't help but he it. does. It's He's compulsion. like, man, this is my one thing. This is my vice. This is the thing. <laughs> Everything else sucks, but this, I'm going to keep it. <laughs> yeah. But the real star in regards to world building in the Death Note is the Death Note itself. Yeah. And the Death Note, this, the Death Note itself is why Death Note is so pervasive and has remained a top popular anime basically since it came out um the the death note itself and the idea that there is a way to just write someone's name and think of their face to kill them and then there's like all these rules with it it just it creates this like ultimate story and there are like side stories to death note where like other people find the death note like one shot mangas where that happens simply because the idea of the death note itself is so freaking compelling um i mean and you'll find it in pop culture everywhere and it's one of the things of why death note is so popular both in japan and in the west because the concept is so compelling it is it's like this cons it, okay so let's talk about like the rules of the death note that we know of mm-hmm. the death note is a notebook that any part of the death book makes it available and on un- and makes it so that you can use it mm-hmm. to kill a person by writing their name down. Mm-hmm. You just write if you just write their name down, within 40 seconds they die of a heart attack. Mm-hmm. You then have like 6 minutes and some odd seconds after you write the name down to write how the the events in which a person will die. Mm-hmm. You cannot control other people through those events. 
So that is like this can only affect the person that you were writing down. Mm-hmm. And it has to be something they can um, potentially do. And it, it can't yes. be something literally impossible. Exactly. But like if uh, it requires them to teleport to do it, it's not going to happen. It's not. Or like going to Paris. I think the example was like going to Paris when they're in lockup. Yeah. Like yeah, that's they, not, they wrote, that's not they wrote something. They wrote something that happened in Paris, but then like the person was actually on in like the Bahamas or something like that. And so it, yeah. so they didn't die, you know. Um, or they did die. Oh, no, they did. They died of a heart, heart attack. attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you, they will still die if they're unca- incapable of doing the thing. It just will be of a heart attack. Yes. Um, and we never learn how long you can control a person's actions. However, we do have an entire episode where uh, we we know that um, that light has manipulated this criminal to hijack a bus. Mm-hmm. And do certain things like touch a touch a piece of the notebook, mm-hmm. like very detailed things. And throughout that entire hijacking, it was all controlled by the Death Note. Mm-hmm. Um, so hypothetically, you could probably control the actions of an individual for a decent amount of time. Yeah. So when they as long when, as it's within their personality to be in. Mm-hmm. So later on they do an analysis because Light, um, and not all of them are written about in, in 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 the manga or in any of the adaptations, but Light does a series of experiment, experiments to try to test the limits of the Death Note, which Ryuk tells him Shinigami would never do that because the only reason that they write names in the Death Note is so that they live longer. It's what they're supposed to do. You know, they they write names in the Death Note the way that a human breathes, right? That's just what you're that's what you're supposed to do. Um, so he doesn't know the limits. So Light does all of these tests, and I think that we find out if you look at like all of the Death Note canon, I think that we find out that you can control someone for a few weeks before their death um that's the mm-hmm. longest that light as light had ever gotten it to work through all of his tests but it depends right it still has to be things that they would realistically do so there are limits and the longer amount of time you're trying to control the person the more likely you are to make mistakes and write something that they can't do and therefore would void all of the directions yeah Exactly. So it's it's just it's a fascinating concept, um, and then it's also like this other thing too of uh, one a trope that is used quite a bit is that it doesn't matter how large the piece is, mm-hmm. if it is a piece belonging to the notebook, it works. It works. Yep, and it works whether you own it or not. So, like, Light can take a page from the Death Note and give it to somebody, and they can write names, and they don't become the owner of the Death Note by doing that. Light still owns it, but they can act for him. They can then see Shiragami uh, from that point on, too. Mm-hmm. They are able to yeah. then access this um, this alternate site yeah. Yeah. of so, sorts. So the power, the power doesn't really of the Death Note really is in the death note itself it really doesn't have to do with the ownership rules the ownership rules are kind of separate from its literal power yes which is very interesting and it gives it gives it a lot of versatility it does i also think it it it, it makes it interesting because it makes it uh it makes the assumption that some things are preordained mm. so we see a lot of preordained uh, things within the world uh every single person has a death date in which the shiragami can see how long they have to live mm-hmm. uh which means that that death is quote unquote inevitable they are mm-hmm. leading towards a death yes uh and then the death note which every shinigami has has the ability to intersect that preordained death mm-hmm. with another preordained death Mm-hmm. Whether that be a heart attack 40 seconds from now mm-hmm. or you not doing of your own actions for weeks leading up to a death that you did that was then now preordained. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so we end up in this situation where it's like um, fate exists, but fate is not the end all be all of what will ultimately happen to you uh, in this world. There's outs. And, and, but like. But it is the outside, or it's the outside magical, powerful mm-hmm. beings mm-hmm. and or objects that have the ability to control that fate. Yeah. Because from there, the Shinigami can control everything from choosing to write your name in the death note 
again, that's where they that they still need to have a death note in order to do that. Mm-hmm. Or or uh they can then make deals with the owners of the death note mm-hmm. to expend half their have those people expend half their lives to then receive sight. Yeah, the Shinigami eyes. Yeah. The Shinigami eyes. So it, it, it is an interesting kind of concept of like, okay, this is then what the world believes. Like, this is the belief of the world. Whether everybody yeah. in character knows that this is what's happening, the story is be under the assumption that every single person has a date that they're going to end, a day that they're going to die, and that has been preordained. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yes, for sure. Um, but other than that, the world is exactly the same. Yeah, it's still our world. Technology, it's still it, it. It still has all the people of our realm of our world. So really, it is this interesting urban fantasy twist of okay when the supernatural object interacts and and realm interacts with our world what happens yeah it's great uh and the end of and at the end of the day it's you know chaos happens <laughs> <laughs> so then i have a question for you landon mm. the question i have for you is if you found the death note what would you do with it A heavy question, Karen. Mm-hmm. Buy me do? a drink first, would you? <laughs> I, have uh, chip, I have chips for you. You can I have, have chips, some chips. Uh, I'll, have, I'll, have, I'll, have some, <laughs> I'll have some uh sour children. Thank you. <laughs> um okay. Realistically. Mm-hmm. Well, if the rule, the fake rule mm-hmm. of Having to write down another name every 13 days was a name. I would never write down a name. Yeah, but I don't think you would do the fake. The only reason the fake rule ever gets in there is so that if Light is caught, he has an alibi. That's the only reason that's in there. So I don't think that would be in there. Because why would a Shinigami put in a fake rule? They wouldn't. But an important thing. The realistic thing is that there are some people in this world I think would be better off dead. Hmm. And it would be really convenient. You know, that's how it starts for light, too. It is. Hand. That is. Here's the thing. That is how it starts. However, the people in my head <laughs> are not in the hundreds. There's two. Two. Uh, and one of them I probably wouldn't kill because they'd give a lot of mer- money to anti-trans organizations. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I think it's an unfair question to ask. <laughs> Yeah, uh, okay, but it sounds like you would be very but tempted I for a would couple be tempted. of names. Yeah. Uh, especially if there was a monster following it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, because you get a Shinigami too, of course. If I, It depends on the Shinigami. If I got a Ryuk, probably would never use it. Because I'd probably be like, that person make me feel guilty. Ren? Ren would tell me it was okay. That I wasn't Ren, a bad person. Ren and would that's make what I would feel need. Like, yeah, Ren would make you feel like no matter what you did, you were still a good and valuable person. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and like be like, let me hold you. Yeah. And uh and that's what I would need because yeah. I would feel guilty for using it. But I would be tempted. Yes. <laughs> All right, Karen. Tell me how you're a better person than I am. Go ahead. <laughs> what would you do with the death note? Okay. So like probably what I would do first, the first thing I would do is absolutely nothing. Okay. I would have to think about it. Mm. A lot. I probably, I probably tell certain people, and I would want to know like what they thought I should do. But the problem with that is, is now I can't really use it without getting caught, because I would. But I would immediately want like want to tell people. So there's this side story. Okay, there's this side story in Death Note where someone gets the Death Note that is like not super interested in killing people, which I am not. Okay, I'm not super interested in killing people. I've said this before on the show, but I truly believe even the worst of us are simply trying their best to live within the system that they're born. I don't think anyone's really good or evil. Like, I don't think that's a thing. I think that the systems can create, the systems that we build can create evil accidentally, you know. So Mm -hmm. I don't really have any interest in killing anybody. But here's what I do have interest in what this character does. He has this elaborate plan to sell the Death Note and make a gajillion billion dollars. I do have an interest in selling the death note and making a gajillion billion dollars. 
So I don't know exactly how I would execute it, but I think that's where my mind would ultimately go is like, how can I make this actually beneficial to my life? And that would be to sell it, you know, because it's still our world with capitalism and all of these things. I could never tell anybody for the same reason that I would tell nobody if I won the lottery. Oh, yeah. See, and that would be that would be everybody that I told at some point in time would be like, I hate, especially, I mean, I think that we're also speaking as, you know, 29 and 32 yeah. versions of ourselves. Yeah. Uh, 32. The, like, Girl, that's 32. Nice. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I, I, I said it and I was like, she's 36. I said 32. Yeah. She's I can be 32. I can be 32. It's okay. <laughs> um, that we, uh, that like very different responses. Oh, and yeah. very I mean, different teenage people Karen, if we were teenagers. Karen, teenagers yeah, teenage Karen would have been like George W. Bush, um, yeah. Saddam Hussein, you know, yeah. I, mean, I would have been right there with light. Like I would have been at his age for sure. Because, I, like, would I, didn't not know be, I would not be at light's level, A, because I don't have that much interest in, <laughs> no, but in right small crim- criminals. Well, no, no, uh, no. Yeah, I don't think I would have like done all the tests that he did and got done like that stuff. But no. I would have been like. There's a couple people, and I would no, have written like some, three or there's some. There's there's some warmongers who yeah, yeah, could yeah. drop dead, and it would be fine. Yeah. Um. You know some some certain leaders of worlds uh, of world civilizations. We have a we have a rare Ash joining the stream. I guess she <laughs> likes Death Note. <laughs> yeah, she I don't know. Like but yeah, yeah. Like um, I think I think like you know teenage but as Karen. Yeah, I would versions. have written a few names. I think. Yeah. I, I, I couldn't tell anybody because then I would be like, man, I know enough people that would sit there and be like, even as an adult, that would be like, you have to kill this person. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I think some people And then would tell me I'm too. beholden to other people. And I don't like that. That's, well, I, that's, that's not good. Uh, well, I would just tell them no. I would just be like, hey, this happened. What did you guys do? No, and then, then I, they I would... would kill me. <laughs> because that's how <laughs> They'd it would happen. They'd have to steal it, though. They'd have to steal it. By killing me. <laughs> my life would suddenly be in danger that's how i see it i love my friends dearly i know none of them would actually kill me i'd be afraid (laughs) but it is it is true that like every people that win the lottery and they think they can trust their friends and family they cannot they turn on them that is true yeah Yeah. the 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 apps it's the concept of like absolute power right and what is absolute power in our society but a shit ton of money yeah never need to worry money or the power to control death. Both yeah. of those things are like that things that would like supersede any sort of affection or human brain thinking. Yeah. And, you know, I think my plan to sell it, like, it's not like that would be a good thing. Like, only a terrible, awful person would buy I feel it. More, so, I feel more guilty. Because so then, then I would be like, man, did I enable that person to then like murder a shit ton of people? Yeah, I would. Like, I that's, mean, that's true. That, that's, that's, that's That to me feels more... That feels more guilt wrenching to me than me writing down a couple names that I think would mitigate harm. Because I guess the reason why I, I can control my own beliefs of like but being like, you? oh yeah, I'm mitigating harm. Yeah, oh yeah. There's like there, like I said, there's like two names that I could be like, man, you're causing more harm than good in this world, and that needs to stop. I guess I just uh, think that once you <laughs> that that kill at least like the way that I think of it. Once you, st- I, I imagine that once you start, it's hard to stop. Oh, I don't think so. I imagine it probably is. I mean, I don't know, but I imagine it once you start, it's hard to stop. Me, I mean, I think that that's the, that is the, here's the deal. That's the lore of the Death Note. Oh, yeah. I would like to think as a person. That you're stronger willed than that. That I, I would have a limit. mm and that limit would not that limit wouldn't slide mm. realistically maybe not uh but i do think that i the know older... that if i held it and gave yeah. it to somebody else even if i profited off of it and then that somebody else started like doing like, their moral compass started to slide to a point that no longer aligned with mine i would have a lot of problems with mm. like mitigating my my place in that yeah at least with yeah. me i can put it on my shoulders or i can try to ignore it but if it's somebody mm-hmm. else i don't get to control their actions and that sucks yeah so i think the conclusion that we're coming to is the only thing you can realistically do with the death note that's any good is give it the fuck back to the yeah, shinigami <laughs> people are not good so no. would we do that i don't no. know i don't i think <laughs> i think i the urge 
to sell it, to make, to secure the life for me and my family would be very, very strong, mm -hmm. very strong, you know? Fair. And, and like, there's no shame, like, there's no, like, trying to shame that at all. Yeah. I just, and, and obviously coming from a different, like, place and idea i don't have a husband i don't have, that i have to like worry about or a family or i'm not the breadwinner of my imagine how many family cat unit, towers right? you could you buy are. your kitty cats landon imagine how many cat towers they're, you could fine. Buy they're, they're fine with one <laughs> <laughs> i'm just saying i'm just saying <laughs> just, i'm just saying uh no i think that but i think that uh yeah i i don't know i think that that's a fascinating thing and yeah. I think that that's like the whole morality of this. And that's I what the second half of the stream is really going to be about. Yeah. But before but we get first, to that. <laughs> you love books about death. Check out Audible at audible.com mm -hmm. slash enter stage window. Our lovely host Audible. We have uh, we have wonderful books available on there. I like to give a book recommendation every single week. But of course... Uh, those of you who are um, long-time listeners know that we're also working through the Hunger Games right now, and mm -hmm. all of the Hunger Games books are available on audible.com. Yep. So, so you can go ahead and get the second one out. so that you're ready when we talk about it, because that's going to be next month, hopefully. Yeah, probably. I believe May. Maybe. Sometime in May. May. Sometime. It Sometime may in May happens. we're going to talk about Hunger Games. Yes. Catching we will... fire. Catching fire. Uh, but this week, let's see if I can pull it up. Uh, this week I read through an entire fantasy series, um, and thought I should be able to share it with you. Let's see if I can do the thing that I'm supposed to be doing. It's not pulling up on uh, your phone. It was not pulling up, so we're gonna do the cover from Kindle. Okay, there we go. Yeah. This is from, from Blood, and, Blood Ash. and Ash by Jennifer L. Uh, Armentout is her last name. And there is an Audible available on, uh, it's actually relatively inexpensive for its credit. I didn't even use a credit for it because it was actually that cheap. Uh, but it's a fun little fantasy series about uh, two worlds. One girl who is being really, who's being raised almost as this religious relic in this idea of an ascension into uh, immortality slash godhood. Mm -hmm. um and her experience of having to live in that world but there's a lot of like morality about death and killing and what she actually is and of course it's a love story so of course it uh, is of course it <laughs> is so that would be my recommendation this week it's a uh it's a six series it's a six book series but the entire but only four books are out the last two are being published this year both of them will be published this year one in july one in december so oh. uh the entire series is about to finish up by the end of the 2023 calendar year nice so okay. it would be a good it would be a good time to read yeah so get so get on that i love audible personally um i read very very slowly because i have um some dyslexia you guys that watch uh, more of my gameplay streams you know that um, because I type in the wrong numbers and letters. Anytime that there's a code, I type in the wrong one. But uh, so I read very slowly. But with Audible, not only can I go faster, I can retain more because my dyslexia is not getting in the way. And I can do chores while I'm reading. It's amazing. And it I will is. tell you also that for the Hunger Games books, they their Audible version is done by the effervescent Tatiana Mason Lee, Miss Orphan Black, Miss She-Hulk. And she's great. Okay. Her voice does sound like Katniss to me. So um, I have really, really enjoyed the audiobooks. I, I have um, I read the first one that way. And I'm starting on the Catching Fire now. Uh, she's great. So I do recommend that if you're reading along with us to get the audible version. Yes. Uh, and since we're doing listening to stuff, can I, I haven't actually asked this off camera. Can I like talk about a podcast that I've discovered yeah, yeah, yeah. recently that I really Go want? For it. Uh, this is called Worlds Beyond Number. Uh, it's a giant ass podcast, so you probably know it, but it's from, uh, it's a DD and d actual play on podcast. It has just started with three episodes in. Um, and it is amazing. If you love anything to do with fantasy and you want your ears to be happy, but you're also like, man, I don't think I can read a book right now and I need other voices. It is a fully immersive audible or uh, auditory experience with background noise and music and everything, as well as like people playing and storytellers crafting a story in a fantasy world that is just 
a it feels like a warm hug to be in mm -hmm. uh it, it feels very like a miyazaki miyazaki was one of the big inspirations in his way of storytelling um so if you like any of those things uh and a really diverse cast it's there's only four of them it is fantastic so karen you should listen to that but anybody also who is here okay uh that is what has captured my heart okay um, if i need it's something not traditional D D. it is it is that Say is the what they're again? playing it's called worlds beyond number worlds beyond numbers this, okay if i have extra time called... i will do it in between the next hunger yeah. Games book yeah this one is called the wizard the witch and the wild one is the well, name i already of the love the title campaign. Uh, and it is it is not a traditional fantasy realm. It is very Miyazaki folklore and sort of aspects of of magic. Very cool. So just need to throw that out there for everyone <laughs> who's watching and listening and needs a podcast. <laughs> I like that. All right. Shall we move on? Yes. So next we are going to get into a little bit of a um, of a talk about some of the characters specifically. So Death Note at the end of the day, as we said, it is a Sherlock and Moriarty story from Moriarty's perspective. So let's talk about this story's Moriarty. Light Yagami. Okay. So Landon, I am so curious because um, mm. this Light Yagami is quite different than the Netflix adaptation Light Yagami. Yes. What was your like, what was your like first impression? Like the first couple of episodes when you were watching oh, it was, how I... did you feel? I said this out loud. And I was like, "Oh, he's a psychopath." <laughs> uh, the night, the one, the one in the Netflix adaptation is not. He is but an innocent boy who stumbles upon a great power and then is corrupted by this. Uh, this light Yagami hides nothing about the fact that he is from the start a monster, uh, which is then what makes the well good light arc very confusing in the middle because I'm just like he never he he that was a mask that was a lie he he was never that uh yeah. even though even though he had the world convinced he was that he wasn't because we saw right from the start that in his in his head how he hated everybody freaking around him mm -hmm. and then was handed a book that then just let him go wild and kill people mm -hmm. uh it's so funny <laughs> it's so funny it's almost like the the death note gave him the power to wear his wear his insides on his outsides like the yeah. death note the death note version of light i also believe is the more real version than good light i know good light is him without the death note memories but it basically just means that he was never given the power to enact what he always wanted to enact anyways yeah That's we see means. light in the first half of the first episode without the death note and he's a he's an asshole Mm -hmm. like people are making fun of him and, and he's very but he's very cold and aloof and very much like not interested in anybody else mm -hmm. and is also like sitting here and being like ugh the scum of the earth these fucking bullies they're mm -hmm. terrible people like I just want to murder them yeah. uh, and then is given a tool in which he can murder them Yeah, uh, and we never see that version of light in the good arc no. uh, which is why I'm like man uh, but I appreciate that because the last thing I necessarily wanted to watch, it's a compelling story that has been told over and over again, to watch a good man slash person be consumed by an evil entity and turned evil. Mm -hmm. Amazing trope. Love it. Seen it a thousand times. Mm -hmm. So the fact that right off the bat, that was not what this was, mm -hmm. was awesome. Because yeah. it was like, oh, this does feel Moriarty-esque. Mm -hmm. It does feel like somebody was given the, the secret weapon they needed yeah. to attack the world. <laughs> yeah, because Light is not a good person ever no. in Death and, Note. And he's, they never try to pretend good. he is. No, not at well, all. The only reason that he's... Yeah, well, I'll talk about that in a second. But I just want to make sure that this is clear. Like The, only, the reason that Light is popular is because... He he is charming and manipulative, mm -hmm. so he knows how to go on a couple of good dates with a girl, for example, before she would really realize that he's kind of a jerk ass, right? He also is the top of his class, which means that he right now is on the trajectory to be one of the few that makes it out of this economic crisis unscathed, right? So that's very attractive, Um and he has uh, good connections i mean his yes. father everyone knows that his father is yes. the, basically the head of police mm -hmm. in all he, of this county 
he tends to follow the rules. So he's not going to be somebody that makes a big fuss that's going to like stand out and be um, annoying or be embarrassing. Right. So a lot, all of light's good qualities are very like uh, outward, very suited to the exact time and place in which he lives. But when you understand his inner morals and boundaries, which we do because we are privy to his inner thoughts that of course his peers are not privy to. We are immediately know that like, no, he is a shit person. The only reason he is good is because he happened to be born in the 90s in Japan. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's it. His Because it internally, he is not a good person. And you are never intended to think that he is a good person no. in the original manga. Now, the anime muddies that a little bit. We'll talk about that in a second. But he's, he's not good ever. Even good mm-hmm. light is not good. Even good light is still manipulative and mistreating of Misa. He's he he is destined to become a serial killer, yes. uh, and you kind of know it because of like all the precautions he automatically knows how to take. Like this is a man who knows how to hide a secret that mm-hmm. just hasn't had a secret to hide, and it's things from like there's this whole montage on how he keeps his door so perfectly locked. Yep. Uh, to tell if anyone's ever broken in. He knows exactly, like, he has hiding places for magazines that he never uses because he yeah. just wants to, just in case someone ever bugs his house. Like, yeah. he he is a serial killer preparing to be that. Yeah. Uh, and, and has those skills already there. And he's, he, we, he, we are never doubting that of doubting that of this mm-hmm. character. Mm-hmm. Uh, even, even when it muddles the, the water. It's never, there's never a doubt that this person is a bad person. Yeah. Um, But yeah, it, it obviously he deteriorates and given the tool to be as evil and megalomaniac. I mean, the, the reality is, is that he wants to become a god. Mm-hmm. That is his purpose, is that mm-hmm. he wants to become a god of death and rid the world of all the evil so that all the good people will worship him. And his definition of evil then starts changing as it impacts him. Mm-hmm. So all so that ultimately we're left with like Naomi being evil because evil because she is reporting the truth of what happened and that might lead to then discovering that he is the killer. Right, because in his worldview, anybody that takes down Kira must be considered evil because they must not understand how much better the world is going to be when Kira's work is complete. Right. So they must be evil in his view. But like that is his view. But that that I think, it, it, at least in my opinion, is very clearly it's very clearly presented as a flaw mm-hmm. of no, I'm just trying to come up with a reason why I need to protect myself. Yes. He is truly just doing it to protect himself. Totally agree. And I think the clearest way that the authors, the authors make it obvious that they do not agree with anything in regards to um, light, really, uh, is the treatment of women, right? He, you, every woman he comes in contact with, he either dismisses or uses. And this is true of light in the first few episodes before he becomes very corrupt. This is true when he is fully corrupted by the death note. And this is true when he gives up the death note, because when he gives up the death note and becomes good light again, you know, the light that he would have become if he'd never found the death note, he still is incredibly cruel to Misa. Like Misa loves him, you know, wants to be his girlfriend and he refuses to reject her. And yet he constantly talks down to her, like, how dare you you know, pine for me when I'm not interested. And yet he never puts his foot down to fully reject her so that she's able to just string along. And it, 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 like he says it in her presence that like, no, she's just infatuated with me. I don't really like her. But he never says that to her. Like he's he's cruel. He leads her along literally. Can I just tell you how excited I was for Misa to come in And the possibility of me getting my Joker Harley Quinn fucking dynamic (laughs) of just like, oh my God, I love you. I love you. I can, like, I can, I can help you. And then like the whatever. Mm -hmm. And not getting that because light (laughs) is such an asshole that he doesn't even bother (laughs) to pretend to care about her. Mm -hmm. Like, 
like at least the Joker manipulated her, it manipulated Harley Quinn into being like, yeah, I love you, baby. Do the thing I want you to do. He doesn't even do that. He does it like once, at the maybe. very beginning, just at the very, in the beginning. very beginning. Yeah, there is, there is no. It is so, and I was just like, <sighs> I wanted one thing. And that's what I wanted. <laughs> well, Landon, one I have thing. A sad thing to tell you: no one cares about Light Misa ship. It is all about. And that's Elmet. fine. I get no one... that. <laughs> I know what I want, <laughs> and what I want <laughs> is a protagonist villain <laughs> who treats a very naive young lady very badly. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I know it's messed up. Media, make this for me. And then don't make it in a way that other people will romanticize it as love. They also need to acknowledge that it's fucked up. We just need to let it live in the fucked upness. (laughs) I think that the only reason that Death Note doesn't go there is because of the target audience being. Oh, yeah. Because the the target audience would be like, that's love. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and this this is the problem. Okay. (laughs) So here we go. This is the problem with, with light. Yagami as a character. Okay, the Death Note fandom at the time that it was airing had the exact same stupid fucking problem that the Breaking Bad fandom has and had. Okay. Like, there is a part of the fandom that's like, light is right. And it's like, fuck, are you fucking crazy? Like, did we watch the same show? What? But yes, this fandom has the same problem that the Breaking Bad fandom has because no matter. Oops, sorry. Oh, Okay, anyways, but no matter what you do, because no matter what you do, when you have your point of view character, you're going to sympathize with them because you're seeing it from their point of view, even if the authors are literally screaming at you that this dude is fucking terrible. That's and that's the purpose. Mm -hmm. That's why we we like morally great characters. Mm -hmm. We do not need we can just sit in the knowledge that these people are bad people. You can like bad people in a story it's mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. yeah you can and light is so i do appreciate that death note goes out of the way to show you that light never is never was and never will be a good person his morals and his core are flawed and unless he was able to give up his ideology he cannot be good it is simply yeah. not possible well and like also like to give credit to this too is that we obviously this is directed to a 16 year old boys light is 16 to 18 depending on ages that he I mean, started he, school he, grow, he grows up he starts yeah. out high school and he ends up you know a college student college so student. He's, he's around so, the teenager basically yeah like he's teenager. he's in his junior year he ends up yeah so basically of that age um his ideology also feels of that age. The concept yes. of being like, if I just kill off all the bad people, people will love me and no bad will happen. Duh. Yeah, if you kill all the evil people, there won't be any more evil. Evil comes from the That's individual, like, Landon. Didn't you know yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. I I did, which is why I was on board for killing people when I right. had the death note. So like, <laughs> like you know, bad things bad things happen because bad people are born into the world. That's what that's yeah. how it works. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. No, people are inherently evil and then create those systems to do their evilness. And systems right. are only created by one person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh-huh. if we kill the bad individuals, no more bad will happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also having empathy to understand why bad people ended up in the place that they ended up and that 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 badness is through the perspective of, in this case, a cis straight man uh, (laughs) of privilege uh, in a in a country of privilege uh, Mm -hmm. doesn't mean like obviously you can then determine what bad is in the world because you don't need any other perspective outside of that you can determine that the criminals who are criminals are bad people not because they're any part of the system yeah right because the justice system never gets it wrong so if they say someone committed a violent crime obviously they did yeah. yeah, and like the understanding also that people commit violence in in a way to survive is an unnecessary thing that we need to. Yeah, well, it doesn't really matter why they did it. The fact that they did it is enough. Yeah, yeah that's what makes yeah. them evil. Is yeah, that and they- the only the only justified <laughs> killing is if you're killing other violent people. That's Here's- okay, but otherwise, it's not okay. Here's the problem, Karen. When we run for president, people are going to just take this clip 
<laughs> and think we're serious. I'm never running for uh, president. <laughs> I'm never running for president. That would, so, again, make me a bad person. <laughs> so Light Yagami's um, terrible. This is Light Yagami's terrible. He's the most terrible in the manga. So if this is part of Death Note that appeals to you, you absolutely have to go back and read the manga because it is the most explicit in that original version. Also love that the 16, like I just, it feels so 16, 17, 18 year old boy to just be like, yes, I, I can be the decider of good and evil in the world. Yeah, it's, it's, um, I mean, every 16 year old boy would kill baby Hitler. I mean, they would. Yeah. Yeah. So of course he would. And then Germany would be saved. For sure. And yeah. anti-Semitism would be cured. Yeah. And no one would hate gay people. Absolutely. Of course not. Of course. <laughs> okay. Well, we have on the opposite end of the spectrum. Oh. Oh, we there's have a still thing text there. there. Well, oh, well, anyway, that was our notes. It's okay. Y'all can see we, we give notes to each other. I forgot to delete it. It's um, fine. I forgot to I forgot to see it. Uh, <laughs> this is this is L the tiny little gremlin that he be apparently he's 20 he looks like he he's 12 year old in my mind i get you it you know what landon just because you you know had to grow up you can't be mad at l that he realized he could continue to make money without growing up don't be jealous uh <laughs> <laughs> yes it's jealousy that i feel when i look at l it is anyway, everything to do with best, me being anyway, jealous the best character L's best character. Um, L is our Sherlockian character. He yeah, is, L is Sherlock. he he is a young man who needs a uh puzzle to solve. Yeah. And it's 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 made explicit in some of the um si- in some of like the other like side stories and stuff that we get with Death Note, where like L he's doing this because he wants to play the most challenging game in the world. That is it. He doesn't actually yeah. have like a moral code of justice not really i mean he has he has some morals but it's not like light where light is very like ideologically driven l is not ideologically driven he's happy so long as the case is complicated because his whole goal the game in life, is a foot yeah his whole goal in life is to play the most complicated most challenging game and you know what yeah. i cannot fault him for that i also have the goal in life to be entertained at all times by puzzles. I would like this. This sounds very good to me. All right. First of all, you sound like a Ravenclaw. Second of all. I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, I think also there is like a level of, uh, yeah, yeah, he's just so, he just finished the last escape room and can't find a good one. Mm-hmm. So now he needs to, now he needs to solve murders that seem impossible. And what's more impossible than a book that allows people to kill other criminals? Right. Uh, and and again, like I think that it's this really important aspect of like he doesn't care. He doesn't have a sense of justice here. There's a whole scene uh, in the first part where Elle is like uh, Matsu. I think it was Matsuki was talking about um, what's going to happen when we catch Kira, mm-hmm. and Elle is just like, doesn't matter. We catch we catch him. That's the that's next- the end goal. Yeah, L L just wants to know that he's right, that he, he solved just, it, that he solved the puzzle. He is the pettiest bitch in the world. Yes. He literally <laughs> needs to know that he's right. And, like, when the ending... It, the other thing frustrating about him is that when the answer is unsatisfying, he refuses to believe it. Uh, which, obviously, makes him right, because the endings that he receives are like he's like oh this person is L, or this person is is Kira, and then he's like mm, I hate that that doesn't I still have like this two percent chance that this this dumb boy over here is Kira. <laughs> uh, so by most and, annoying thing, I think you mean the best thing about yeah. Him. <laughs> sure, he has. <laughs> the, they are the same character. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a way, in a way, because it is like this idea of like, oh, I'm just gonna like Yeah, no, L, L is light Light's, without ideology behind it. Yeah, light sense of justice is like I know all and I know better. <laughs> and that's also L's sense of justice, but he also doesn't care what happens after he's right. Yeah. For him, it's all about the game. It's not about like he wouldn't care if the he doesn't ever think about is the world generally good or bad? What can we do to make a better world? Like these thoughts do not occur to L. No. He doesn't Definitely. care. He's a child. 
He's but a 12 year old boy. He's not 12. So the thing with L is in an original um, outline of Death Note that was never like this was never published, but an original outline of Death Note, L is much older. And then Near and Mellow, which we'll talk about next week because that's in part two, were his kids, right? But um, as they were developing Death Note, two things happened. One, they realized that for the L and Light dynamic, the Sherlock and Moriarty dynamic, to be compelling, L could not be significantly older than Light. And they really wanted Light to be starting out as um, an older high school student because, remember, the point is to talk about that lost generation, right? So they realize they have to make L young. They can't make him older than his early 20s or whatever, right? Otherwise, like, the game between the two is just not compelling. And then in addition to that, uh, I, I can't remember if it was the author or the artist, but anyway, one of them said, and also, I cannot imagine L having sex, so it doesn't, so he's not going to have kids. <laughs> So, you know what? A lot of the fandom can definitely imagine Elle having sex. I'm just saying. But it's just with light. <laughs> this is also a big reason why Death Note was popular. Death Note was not yeah. just popular because of the uh, because of the Death Note itself. It was super popular because of, um, of, of, of Elle and Light's dynamic. Big part of it. Big, big part. Talk about it. Okay. <laughs> Let's talk about it. Uh, I listen. Two sides of the same coin. The yin and yang. Mm -hmm. The blue and red. The good mm -hmm. and bad. The, mm -hmm. the puzzle master versus the puzzle piece. Mm -hmm. They do be. I get it. Okay. In theory, I get it. I understand. Are they dreary? No. But these two boys are just looking for someone to complete them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> looking yeah. for for a cat and a mouse. They are Tom and Jerry. Yeah. In the most fucked up way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We love them. Um, so good. And I think that I, I picked this screenshot for this slide because the good light arc is bad. Okay. I, we haven't talked specifically about it, but I will tell you, we don't like it. Nobody likes it. But there We're is one beautiful scene that the good light art gives us. And that is Light and L fighting while handcuffed. It is beautiful. It is compelling. It is the best scene in Death Note. When the couch flips over, you just, oh, wow. Poetry in motion. So, yeah, um, we love them. And I support the L and Light ship. And the fact that it is still it still has fans in 2023, I think, is a beautiful thing. Um, and they deserve them. Yeah. <laughs> they do. They do. They deserve them. I, I appreciate how they continuously push each other to the edge of sanity. Yeah. Like, it is this thing. Of, uh, and that... <laughs> there is a little camp situation about it where yeah. like light comes up with this ridiculous r truly ridiculous scheme that one could not plan at all on any reasonable human existence and then light and then uh, light plans that and then l comes in at like step number three of a 15 step plan and just cuts light short <laughs> without realizing it but also enjoying that he's doing it yeah uh and like then that that causes l to be like but what else can i do how must mm -hmm. i go from here and then light's like oh but what if what if kira is l and then it's just that for 15 episodes and i love it <laughs> it's amazing yeah uh, because there is like a lot of like this push and pull, uh, of a villain and protagonist duo, which we see a lot in media. Sherlock Holmes, I guess, is like the most obvious. But thinking of like any major serial killer in any of the major, uh, cop shows, yeah. uh, any any like anything in Vampire Diaries. I mean, the push pull between Klaus and Stefan. Yeah, like, that was this, a really good arc for Stefan. This con these concepts of two of two related things that seem to represent opposites mm -hmm. but truly don't is a trope that is fantastic. Yeah. So 
I mean, and we're seeing it. Sorry, go ahead. Oh no, I was saying like if you want to if you want to write this good, like basically, cut this. This is the template. Like this is the template. Um, if perfectly executed. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think what makes it unique and gives it a new switch, which is a lot of fun. And a perspective that we don't see very often that allows that sort of like cut at the feet sort of sort of moments is that we're seeing it through the villain's eyes. Mm -hmm. Even though he's the protagonist of our story, we are seeing it through the person that like we would usually be rooting against. Yeah. And that because like in moments where we would like sit there and be like, oh, I'm going to solve this thing and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to stop this thing before it even happens. Like we're always Whoa, go. And now because we're experiencing the same thing, but from the villain's point of view, we're just kind of like motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a 15 step plan and you're stopping me at seven. <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and um, and L and light. We have a very like uh, good versus evil sort of thing yeah. that goes on and the anime kind of like heightens this, right? So um, are we good to move on to themes? I wanted, I wanted, well, I just wanted to very quickly, like, I know we're going to talk about this, but I very quickly wanted to talk about the God, like yeah, good yeah, versus yeah. evil, but God versus Satan. That it's yeah. like this concept of like an all knowing good entity of the police force is L and we have this corruption corruptive material brought forth by light mm. uh, and that they're constantly like playing against each other for the greater good but because it's because God because L represents like not going in a good place not fixing mm -hmm. anything but rather the status quo it kind of represents that like all seeing all knowing God mm -hmm. uh, and it's an interesting concept which then of course relates to the themes yes okay so we've got several themes that we want to talk about here and in this kind of the main thing that i want to say is the overall themes of death note because the target audience is what it is are not as deeply explored as we would like but we do want to touch on them and at least point them out so the first one is capitalism is greedy and when Light becomes good Light and gives up his death note, he has to make sure that there is somebody out there that's continuing the work of Kira because that's what's really important to him. Like he truly believes this better world is going to exist. So he's like, who would actually, uh, you know, kill people? And he gives this task to to Rem to find somebody. And of course, you know, um, Light and Rem decide that who would actually kill bad people? Oh, uh, high-powered executives. They would use the Death Note. They they wouldn't be like, this is not for me. They do it. And so what does this mean? Okay. This and they do it gladly. Yes. And willingly. Yes. With enthusiasm. Mm -hmm. And so that's what they do. So obviously, Death Note is saying capitalism is greedy. And this fits right in with the original... Um, uh, it, things that Death Note is really trying to comment on, and it is the the fear and the anxiety of entering a workforce that uh, that isn't ready for this this generation that the economy can't support them. So of course, uh, you know whether they say it or not, authors' um, opinions of capitalism are not that good. Obviously, you know anybody that graduated college in two thousand eight, like I did, I don't I don't think is going to have a very good opinion of capitalism now. Um, I might disagree with them on the solutions, but uh, but I think we're both going to say that there's a problem there, right? And so obviously, Death Note agrees that there is a problem there. Unfortunately, this is just um, a little bit too subtle, and it's not very well explored. I wish that we learned more about these guys during that section of the show because that is the that is the element of that section that interests me since you know light is such crap in that section nobody cares i don't want to hear from him but i would like it to would have been a real this. it would have been a really interesting like turn of events mm. if it had been a first season instead of instead of a like because it wasn't even a part it was all still part of part one yeah but if it was a first season dedicated to building up the light l dynamic yeah. and him exploring and, and light exploring what he wants having to give it up and then a second season where instead of focusing on light as our protagonist 
we focus more so on Elle as the protagonist with this then being the antagonist. Mm -hmm. And and Light still in the background watsoning it in some ways because as good as good Light or whatever. I think that that would have been more successful because we do skim over this so quickly and it's it's because again they don't want to bring poli- they didn't want to bring into a political show they didn't necessarily want to do that even though it didn't conceit- match the target audience like the target it doesn't audience doesn't, the tar- doesn't really care what these high powered executives are thinking or their motivations no. or why they're doing it they just care like they they're just like okay executive evil got it but the That's conceit all they need. the conceit and the idea and the way that it was brought up requires mm-hmm. it Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's why it also like it feels so hollow because not only do we hate good light during this but there's also very little care about who now has the death note yeah yeah and that's not where the focus should be the focus should be with who has the death note now Mm -hmm. like my my favorite episode of this section is the Matsuda episode where he basically goes on a series of um, of hijinks to fake his own death because he just stumbled into the wrong place at the wrong time. And it's because, and it's literally because we get a glimpse into Matsuda. Also, Misa gets to actually show some of her strengths and her intelligence during that episode, which is nice. We don't get to see that very often. Um, turns out she is smart. Don't We don't, yeah. we don't think she is because she's always told in a negative light, but it turns out that she, she is. is capable of great things. Yeah, she is actually not dumb. So um, that's the only, uh, like I can think, I mean, I, I enjoy the the handcuff fighting scene, but the only episode that I really like is of this section is Matsuda. Um, and I would have loved this section, just like you said, Landon, where maybe it's from Elle's perspective. I think it also could have been from the perspective of um, Higuchi, the, the guy that has the death note here. It could have been from I mean, Matsuda's perspective. Like all we would have really had to do to make this section better is to not have light as the POV character. All of these other p- characters would have been better POV characters for the good light arc, you know? It's like you're telling the story of death note. So yeah. it should follow the book. It shouldn't yeah. follow the character who once owned it. Yeah. Like that's not, if we, I think there needs to be a connection. I need, I think that there still needs to be a concept, especially because he gets it back. Mm-hmm. But that's not the like concept, like that it should have been someone else. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I also get that they didn't want it to be someone else because they also had an audience relating to light. Yeah. Like they successfully did that. That they, even though they painted him as a terrible person, they had an audience relating to him. Mm-hmm. So then also all of a sudden they had to make him a good person because what kind of lessons are you teaching teenage boys that this is the person you want to look up to? Mm-hmm. Which is the responsibility that media unfortunately possesses is that because people watch it, they then like feel like that that's emulating what society wants. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so all of a sudden you have an evil person as your main character doing terrible things and a very popular show it's got to be like just kidding we need we need that he's good too guys he's good too and he was cool when he was good (laughs) so in my script doctored version of death note that is an adaptation based on the manga instead of based on other adaptations um we switched the pov character during this section yeah so that we can talk more about the capitalism being greedy uh, and make Light still bloodthirsty and terrible during this time, too. Yeah. Well, he still is. We just have him mistreating Misa. I think that's enough. It didn't give off bloodthirsty. And it didn't give off the same. It didn't give off the same level to me. I was like, yeah, wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, without, the, without the Death Note memories, but Misa he also up. <laughs> isn't a, Misa is also not a likable character. Yeah. So, like, m- him mistreating her, realistically, no one is, like, sitting there and being like, I mean, maybe that sounds... At this point, I was chucked out. I hated. I hated this arc. Well, also, if we lean more into this capitalism is greedy theme, then we give Misa a lot more to do so that she has yes. the potential to be likable because she is being taken exactly. advantage of by the system very explicitly yes. with the way that her so, modeling career goes. No, capitalism is greedy. Capitalism is greedy, and not only that, but then like can use this power to their advantage to further further their own greed mm-hmm. uh, and will. Yeah. Then we have next theme, uh, the definition of justice. Yeah. So we get all kinds of different perspectives in Death Note of what justice means. And I don't necessarily feel like Death Note 
in part one or part two, ever lands on what it believes is true justice other than not light. That's all it says really is not light. But all the other definitions, I think that Death Note believes all of the other definitions are possible. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so all is, are, are yeah. possible, but also like that, like the concept that justice isn't defined, I think is a theme in itself. Yes. Like, I think that that's an important concept and a lesson that it's trying to teach overall to its viewers of being like, what Light thinks is justice is not justice, but also what L thinks is justice is not justice. Mm -hmm. And what justice we want is not the justice we're going to get, which is, I think, that other important conversation about, like, what's going to happen to Kira when we take him. Or, like, the concept that, like, also, Light and Misa and uh, Light's father were all basically captured and imprisoned for like sixty days. That's for, not justice. For, that's not justice, especially because there was very little proof on two of them. <laughs> yeah, there was no evidence. You know? uh, and then, and then also had to go through this whole thing where like Light's father, like Light's father, was leading them to th- their execution, and then was going to shoot them in the head. Mm-hmm. Like none of that. Is, I mean, obviously it tells a good story, but none of that is justice. Yeah. And so, like on a story that is so focused, hyper focused on justice, there really is little definition of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I and I, I do think that's purposeful. I do think that's purposeful. That mm-hmm. um, they never give you what they believe justice actually is in Death Note because they believe that it really is not defined. I also think that this is like its way of also the creator's way of also sitting there and saying like there isn't a thesis statement here. Mm-hmm. Our mm-hmm. thesis statement is not that Light's way is the way to do it or that this way is the way to do it. All we're doing is commenting and making art about a problem that we see. And then half and then and then commenting about like, well, what if it was solved this way? Mm-hmm. Not that it should be solved this mm-hmm. way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not uh, presenting a solution to the problem at all. Which like which is very common with uh evil led shows, mm-hmm. thinking breaking breaking bad being another one of like, this is not how we solve the drug ec- epidemic slash poverty epidemic yeah. slash medical debt epidemic here in the United States. Uh, however some people think it is but whatever um, it, it's like that concept of like this is just an alternative not mm-hmm. a thesis statement where mm-hmm. so many where so many medias are like this is how we do it mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah so there's something there is something a little bit refreshing about that all right and then on top of that too the morality of killing yeah We watch several characters become corrupted by the Death Note. Yes. Uh, This concept of absolute power held in the hands of somebody and how that warps them, warps their humanity, warps their mind Mm -hmm. and their abilities. And we see it most with the light of his his thesis statement being, I am only going to kill the evil people. To going to the lengths that he goes to, that I don't even think killing L is about his safety anymore. It becomes about the enjoyment of winning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think and so too. The, and that the reasonings of like, oh, what started off as uh, a moral crusade has been corrupted. Yeah, and we see that with Misa as well. Yep, we see that with everybody in both part one and part two. Everyone that gets a hold of the Death Note and starts killing um, eventually loses the original reason they had to start it, right? Every single character. It doesn't go good for them. None of them. They all end up in a bad, in a worse situation than they were in before they found the Death Note. Yeah. We're going to talk, talk a little bit more about that in part two. But it's true in part one and part two. Killing killing corrupts you. Like, killing people is not good. Death Note is saying that very clearly. Killing people yeah, is not good. Yeah, I think, I think that that is the thesis statement, if anything. It's like yeah. that, that the... Kill is bad, acts, you guys. <laughs> the acts of evil are not good. Yeah. Um, Which is an interesting, like, obviously a good 
thesis statement to have, but an interesting yeah. one too of of how it is shown about a about a show that is supposed to be entertaining and treats its evilness kindly. Yeah. Is also showing that like, no, you do this once, you are a terrible person. Yeah. Yeah. Can't disagree. Which uh, means I'm a terrible person because I choose the death note. I guess so. Uh, that's <laughs> fine. I mean, you'd sell it. So you're a terrible person too. Yeah. I mean, so by proxy, I'm killing like way more people. <laughs> I mean, I could turn into light and just go ham. You never know. Like, actually, it turns out that Karen was my L all along. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> okay. And there's one last theme that we would really like to touch on. And that is the religious symbolism. So. In Death Note, the anime, there is all of these like Christian choirs and bells and organ sounds behind it. The first opening is full of religious artwork where light takes the place of one of the characters in the in the artwork. It's all over the um, the anime adaptation of Death Note. And Landon, I, if you can talk about this first, since you had never read the manga before, I, I say the things that I want to say about it. Yeah, I mean, I think that like so what I originally thought from this was that it was taking and stealing from and, and stealing me more like paying homage to all walks of popular beliefs and religious symbols within Japanese culture. So again, remember how I said earlier, remember that Shinigami exists within Japanese folklore. Uh, the, I thought that the reason why they used the Shimigami was because of that. Like, it was this idea of pulling through the traditional folklore. There's a lot of Buddhism, uh, sort of, like, concepts of of life and um, peace and, uh, like, the the morality of the role we play within the bigger service of, of a community that exists there. And I thought, ooh, there's some Buddhism in there. And, and, and all these other cultures that I thought really were pulling together to represent an interesting ideology of Japanese culture, including religious sim sim symbolism of Christianity, because Christianity does have a huge foothold within Japanese culture. So I was like, whoa, this is cool. This is awesome. Come to find out, doesn't Not exist true. in the manga. <laughs> so the only religious, the only Christian symbolism in the manga is that Ryuk loves apples. That's it. They, they, the manga makes no comment. And this is now an invention of the anime. And because most of the other adaptations start with the anime as their starting point to make their adaptation, a lot of the adaptations move farther and farther and farther away from the original point until you get and then you get to the Netflix one, which is extra crappy. But here's here's I have a couple of thoughts on this. OK, so let me just first explain. So remember, the manga began in Shonen Jump, right? And so that's why even though the theme seems like it should be a highly political topic, that's really not the intention. The intention is to be more the Sherlock Holmes and Moriarty, right? So the Christian imagery and music is not part of the original manga. And basically, when, you, when you're going through this and, uh, and Light is kind of this like Jesus martyr figure, um, it becomes challenging, I think, for a lot of people to absorb that properly because the only way that that works is if you think that there is something fundamentally evil about the process of evangelizing which i kind of do so i kind of really like this because it ties the act of like pushing your religion out onto other people which is light is doing by killing the other people and by recruiting followers and things as an inherently evil act but most people do not think of Christianity that way. They do not, they're not commenting on that aspect. So what they I see so. then, yeah, what they see then is then light is kind of this like pitiable figure, like, oh, if he had never found the death note, then think of what what a good person he could, no. Okay, no. I think it's really cool that in Japan, they do have some Christianity, but they don't have a Christian culture right no. overall so they don't really understand it so they can play with these religious symbolisms in weird and interesting ways and death note's a good example of where it gets played with in weird and interesting ways but those weird and interesting ways then get misinterpreted and then you get all the crappy adaptations so that's that about that 
Um, I like it in here, but that's because my takeaway from it is like, oh, evangelizing is evil. Yes, I agree. And I, I have just seen so much Christian adaptations not to be, like, not be anti-Christianity. Uh, and also knowing that the fan base is loyal to Light and does not see him in a negative light, this concept of, like, a Jesus reborn Mm -hmm. rather than, like, rather than, like, the coming of a new day or the, like, the end of times. Yeah. Is dislike. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, When I first watched it and didn't know, I didn't mind it as much. Like, I liked the Apple concept. I really liked, like, the organ and the symbolism behind, like, seeing the stained glass of L. And I thought more of, like, that's his background. A church is where he was raised. He was an orphan. That sort of, like, idea. But then when you put it into perspective, I was like, ooh, yes, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you see like, that, like, the, the anime, by adding this, it causes a fundamental misunderstanding of what Death Note is really about. Yeah. Well, and I think also then, like, it's just interesting that when that happens, it's, I think that we are so, since we, since America has such a large media presence, we, a lot of the industry, most of the industry of the world is here made in America. Yeah, that's true. Um, and most of the industry of the world and what is popular is made by um, Americanized authors, p- uh, producers, writers, actors, all of that. That it is a very rare time that our tropes are used in a way that is misinterpreted, mm-hmm. much like we misinterpret other religions, concepts, yeah. ideas from other cultures, and we try to like fit them into and pigeonhole them into our story. That's what happened here. Yeah, of We're being on the like, end. you know, like oh. You know, Michael, which is, I believe, who is the, the angel Michael, which is like yeah. the wrath and destruction and, and wrath and and reckoning sort of angel is the one that is behind uh, is behind light here is like, OK, you've taken this symbolism that you don't, I think, understand yeah. how deep it goes. <laughs> yeah, they don't. They The director of the anime did not understand what he was really doing by adding this in. And the only way to properly interpret it is a way that most people are not going to interpret it. And, you know, there would have had to have been so much more context for most people to land on my interpretation. And so it just becomes a muddled mess. Um, hey Koneko, by the way. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Papa. Yeah, you're 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 at you're all the way to the, the lead up. This is what we've been leading up to. <laughs> this is the thesis statement we have. Mm-hmm. So like uh, yeah, I mean I the I it's it's kind of creates within me this love-hate relationship between the religious symbolism because I also blame this part for a big reason why the Netflix adaptation is as bad as it is because it makes other changes that's that makes light even more pitiable and he was never supposed to be well, pitiable. I no. also think he was never. But I also think that then they also made him American. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They shouldn't. Have and done. if you have, and if you have an American, like it's harder for an American company with American producers and American writers to make an American be at fault and evil. Yeah, the only way that they is really not done it. that is not in line with the propaganda no. that we like to create here. And no, it's <laughs> and, not. And so, we- yeah, he becomes this pitiful idea of of like holy shit i'm in over my head Mm -hmm. unlike this moment of reckoning uh, of like oh i am prepared to watch the world burn for my righteousness yep so if they were to make an american death note i believe the only carryover character should be ryuk ryuk should drop the death note for a totally different person and we tell a totally different story that's my opinion it could be interesting i think it'd be awesome I yes. think realistically, if someone is willing to critique America and also write that story, I would love to read that story. Yes. Yes. Uh, however, they, they would have to be a critique of America, which the Death Note was not. No, it wasn't. It was talking about the phenomenon that, that were happening in uh, a Japanese economic crash. Mm-hmm. 
Right. And the phenomenon that was happening in the Japanese economic crash and also then trying to make a, which is what's been happening in American media, an unlikable character likable in a way that then absolves him of his sins, which we're famous for doing. We love uh, the Joker being mm. an example of that currently, mm-hmm. uh, you know, and, and it's hard love- to pull off. It's hard to pull off. It, so. No, I don't think it is. I, I think it's hard to pull off successfully. Yes. I don't think, I can't think of a time of media in which it has been pulled off truly successfully. Because I'm like, man, we have the Joker who's like the Joker from the movie, which is like a terrible person. Mm-hmm. But like men are like using it as their manifesto of being like, this is yeah, we, <laughs> this and we, the reason why everything's awful. And we have such low media literacy in this country that um you know expecting everyone to understand it i think is quite a far reach you know for most people <laughs> yeah 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 for most hey, people blue. to understand it <laughs> hi blue yeah so so that's what we would like to end off with in regards to part 1 of death note so we come to our final question so for part 1 landon did it resonate i wouldn't say it resonated uh, i think it was good i think the first 14 episodes were entertaining Mm. uh i like the concept uh however i didn't necessarily connect to anything beyond the concept and conceit Mm -hmm. of this story Mm -hmm. so as someone who struggles with you know what it what resonated and i don't think i've said this yet is that i uh, what resonated was that the first we're episode six in and I'm realizing that I want to watch the next episode. And I have this thought where I'm like, hmm, Karen might make me a weave after all. <laughs> uh, let it be known. I stopped having that thought after episode 14 and it became real hard to watch. But uh, that's what resonated of being like, this form of storytelling could work. Mm-hmm. I get it. I, mm-hmm. I, I I can see a world in which I would have liked this. Mm-hmm. If you would have watched it when it was coming out, I think you would be a Death Note fan. I, mean, do, do, do. I was young. It. I was yeah. a little young. That's true. That's true. If I was of the right age, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, so what about you, Karen? Did did this resonate? Does it still resonate? So what's that? I think for me, Death Note never really resonated. Because even when I was first watching, and I love Death Notes, so I'll explain that in a moment. Even when I was first watching it, I always wished it would do it would comment more on the underlying politics. I always wished that because that was a big part. But um, L and Light was a big ship for me at the time. OK, and I was, of course, watching week to week when it was coming out. And I love the concept of the Death Note itself. So this is probably the first piece of media that we've watched where I would say I'm a big fan of it and I really like it, but I'm not sure it really resonates. I find it purely entertaining. Purely, yeah. I love L and I love the Death Note and I love the L and Light together. Um, yeah, but That's I also, I, like it. I also think it's, I also think it's the first. It's also the first media we have watched that was not meant for us. Yeah, we are two we're American not part of the women audience at all. Yeah, we're two American women in our early or late 20s 30s like we are not of the culture of the people not the target audience yeah uh and We're even the right and, age gender or ethnicity <laughs> and even yeah and like even when we were of the correct age we were not the right gender or ethnicity or culture mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh so like i don't know if it's ever was supposed to resonate mm-hmm. with us mm-hmm. uh but it can, but something can be entertaining and still not resonate, which I don't, or, which I don't think we've had yet on the show. And yeah. I'm, so I'm kind of glad that we've been able to do that, especially because part two will have a very different answer to this question. Yes. So, um, so let's talk about that. So this was just covering part one of Death Note. So that means from the beginning until Elle's death. Next week, we're going to be talking about part two of Death Note. So that's the part that features near and mellow and then the actual ending of Death Note. So if you enjoyed this, please come back to hear us talk about part two uh, of this show. Uh, as you can probably guess, we have a very different opinion of part two than we have of part one. So if you're curious about that, please come back. Yes. In the meantime, 
Karen, where can they find you? Oh my gosh, you can find me right here on Twitch. You can also find me on YouTube. I post all of my VODs there. Um, so for those watching the YouTube VOD, by the way, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe down below. Um, and also we'll go ahead and say goodbye. Goodbye to YouTube. So for y'all watching the VOD on YouTube, thank you so much for watching. And of course, as always, don't forget to make it a great day. Don't forget to be awesome. Woo!